really really quickly you're gonna see a new me pop up in just a second i um thought this was an in-person meeting and I was driving to denver and i had to turn around so you're gonna see my computer come on so you see a new mad just switch to that one and i'll get off my phone thank you we're looking forward to the new matt gray <laughs> All righty, I guess we are going to go ahead and get started. We have um, seven of our committee members. Uh, we also have um, our transportation committee co-chairs, our uh, RTD representatives, um, and then some. So I, th I think we have enough folks to go ahead and get the conversation started. Uh, we just, w I want to open up and uh, uh, open up the conversation with just a, a big thank you to everyone who participated in the last year plus of work. Um, thank you for all of your effort, your work, your, um, you know, your input on, on all of the processes and robust conversations. And I know um, there have been many, you know, conversations, um, you know, through this public channel, which, you know, I'm really glad that we have set up. And um, I'm excited that now we've gone through this process of coming up with these recommendations, you know, having uh, broken out some of the work in those three subcommittees with the co-chairs um, and subcommittee chairs, and then multiple public presentations around these recommendations. And then now finally having an opportunity after um, that process under was underway, um, to have RTD weigh in on, on some of our recommendations and now the opportunity to kind of dialogue a little bit more about um, where we are. So just wanted to say thank you. And I know um, this is, I think we're all pretty, uh, we've been looking forward to having this conversation. So I'll stop there and um, pass it over to my co-chair, Elise. Thank you, Crystal. Um, I too want to just say thank to, thanks to everybody, certainly the governor and uh, Senator Winner and Representative Gray for their leadership in creating the committee. Dr. Cog, I don't think you had any idea what you were getting into when you said you'd staff <laughs> this. And I'm sure that the committee members joined me in not having any idea how much time and energy we would put into this. I counted up this morning all, over 80 meetings in the last year that I've participated in, right? So um, it's all from a love of RTD and transit and the desire to make RTD the best transit agency in the country, maybe the world, who knows, but um, there's a lot of dedication and service that went into to this effort. So thank you. I also wanna give a shout out to our RTD uh, members, Lynn and Troy, who were with us all the way and CEO Deborah Johnson, who, who joined RTD in November and I think made every meeting since then, which I was really above and beyond the call of duty. So really felt the RTD engagement in this effort. Um, just 30 seconds about how this meeting's going to run. Um, as soon as I stop talking, which will be shortly, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Deborah Johnson's going to make a short presentation on RTD's response to our recommendations. We've all read um, their response, so I asked her not to go into detail um, so that we could spend more time talking. We're going to all give general responses to the RTD response, and then we're going to dive deep um, on specific recommendations of interest to the committee members and to, to lawmakers in the governor's office. Um, I know for sure uh, four have been highlighted, and that's the um, use of federal monies for rebuilding ridership and fares. Lo uh, local service councils and Northwest Rail are four that we definitely want to get to, and then we'll, we'll add others as people are interested. So Crystal and I will keep the conversation moving along so that we get to all of those. And with that, we will turn it over to CEO Johnson. So thank you so much, um, Madam Co-Chairs. I appreciate the opportunity and just wanna reiterate the thanks and gratitude as outlined in previous comments that have been made. Uh, thank you to the governor's office as well as to uh, Senator Winner, Representative Gray, uh, Dr. Cog staff, members of the RTD board, and um, to the accountability committee in and of itself. So um, instead of pulling up the presentation I sent, I can just talk at a very high level um, in the interest of time as we discussed, um, Madam Chair. So with that as introduced, I am Deborah Johnson, General Manager and CEO, and I appreciate the opportunity being afforded to me this morning to discuss um, RTD's responses to the accountability committee's recommendations. 
the accountability committee's report and RTD's response represent a monumental undertaking of stakeholders and partners engaging in a pursuit of a more efficient and equitable and responsive transit system. Just as you said, um, Madam Co-Chair Elise Jones, that you know the intent here is to ensure that RTD can be the agency in which it was created to be, and perhaps maybe one of the best in the country. That is going to take you know earnest, open dialogue um, of which we've been doing, and we will continue to do so this morning. So recognizing that this collaborative effort began back in July 2020, and the first meeting of the Accountability Committee was held on August 10th, uh, 2020. Um, I found it to be interesting as I was looking through some information and uh, recognized that one year to the day later on Tuesday, October 10th, 2021, uh, the RTD Board of Directors adopted the agency's 2021-2026 strategic plan. And the plan established the agency's new mission, vision, and values, as well as four new strategic priorities designed to serve as a foundation for sustained organizational success and alignment. Um, those elements are community value, customer excellence, employee ownership, and financial success. And in order to achieve success, there are specific tactics aligned with each priority and key performance metrics to monitor progress and assess how successfully we are achieving set outcomes. Um, I want to highlight that community value, that is RTD's commitment to be a strong community partner, providing value to customers as well as to the broader Denver metro region while sustaining planet Earth is the first among the priorities. And this is intentional. Further, I would highlight that many of the accountability committees uh, recommendations neatly align with the tactics, metrics and priorities and success outcomes identified in the strategic plan. Following, as we indicated at the outset of the conversation here, 12 months of diligent and time intensive efforts by the accountability committee and its subcommittee, as well as Dr. Cog and RTD staff, the final committee's report was submitted on July 20th. And RTD's board of directors in close collaboration with staff thoroughly reviewed each of the recommendations and aligned those responses that were ultimately approved during the board meeting on August 24th, 2021. It is important to note that RTD either agreed or partially agreed with almost every recommendation made by the accountability committee. Of the individual recommendations, RTD agreed entirely with 30 of them and partially with an additional 16. Essentially, RTD disagreed with only one recommendation and that is the recommendation regarding consolidation of discounted fares to cover equity populations, which is in many ways obviated by the system-wide fair study and equity analysis currently underway. Responses to the solicitation for a consultant to support this endeavor are due um, mid-October, which is in a few days, and staff plans to present a recommendation for the optimal consultancy to lead this effort for the board's consideration in November. So this milestone places RTD on track to develop an equitable fair structure, which will include updated past programs by late 2022. The equity analysis is consistent with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and with guidance from the Federal Transit Administration. Outreach conducted as part of the study will include specific community groups, including those serving the Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities, youth, seniors, persons with disabilities, persons who are unhoused, veterans, and the LGBTQ plus communities as well. In some, RTD and the Accountability Committee are and have been closely aligned on many of the same issues. RTD has welcomed the opportunity to continue to convene, collaborate and partner with community customers, regional stakeholders and the legislature and the governor's office. And the agency will continue to value and honor those partnerships as the agency continues to fulfill its established mission of making lives better through connections. Um, at this time, I would welcome discussion or questions on any of the responses. And I would ask Dr. Cox staff, if it's necessary, if you all are so inclined, um, we could pull up the presentation to the appropriate slide that we might be all on the same page, visually speaking. So with that, I'll yield the floor back to um, uh, the co-chairs. Thank you. Thanks, um, CEO Johnson. And, it, and a, a committee member, I think it was Rhett, pointed out we didn't ask for public comment. Um, I don't know if there's any public on here, but um, that would be poor public process. So let me just pause now that you've... Um, made your introduction to see if there's any members of the public on that would like to speak to us briefly before we engage in our dialogue. 
There is one uh, phone, somebody who's calling in. I can't recall if there is a different process to allow them to um, add for comment. Yes, Madam Chair, they would just need to hit star nine to raise a virtual hand and then star six to unmute themselves. That isn't the old Matt Gray. I believe he said he was trying to log in via computer. Did he not? Yeah, I, I, I'm almost done here. I'll be on just a second. Okay. So it seems like maybe we don't have any public comment. Doesn't appear that way. Uh, there are a couple uh, RTD board members um, in the attendee um, list uh, as a note. Uh, we have been trying to promote them for some reason. Um, it's not allowing us to bring them over. Uh, the one suggestion I could make is that they can maybe log out and log back in and then see if we can promote them from there. Okay. Okay, well, maybe in the interest of time, we should just move on and um, thanks for putting that out, Rut. Um, so the way Crystal and I had structured this was that we wanted to give time for general responses to um, the response that RTD gave the committee on its recommendations before we dive deep into specifics. And I think we would start off maybe with the co-chairs and committee members and then turn to um, the governor's office and state lawmakers and then give a chance for RTD to respond to our response to their response um, and then dive deep. So with that, Crystal, did you want to start or would you like me to? Uh, go ahead, go for it at least. Okay, well, um, being a huge believer in direct but civil communication, um, I would want to thank RTD again for, I feel like there was very good faith involvement, deep involvement, particularly by um, the board members I mentioned and, and CEO Johnson. But I have to say, and I think I speak for the committee that given the purpose of the committee and the energy that we put into coming up with recommendations that we think provide some of the transformational change that RTD needs, that we are a bit underwhelmed by the response, not, not by the intention, but um, we are at a particular moment in time where there are huge challenges facing RTD and the external context that RTD operates in. And I, I'll, I'll list some of them out. We're going code red on, on climate change. We are going into severe non-attainment and on ozone. We're coming through a pandemic where um, equity and the disparities facing some of our populations are looming larger than ever. And transit and RTD is, is, is the uh, provider of transit in the metro area is one of the solutions to all of those huge, huge systemic challenges. And it really requires RTD to step up and embrace the moment in, in a large way. And what I heard and in reading between the many partially agrees is thanks for your input. We're doing our strategic plan. We've got this covered. Um, and yeah, we're happy to work with you, but we're gonna be cautious and move down the track largely in the way that we've been going. And that wasn't the impetus for the recommendations, the committee's existence. And I think the recommendations are pushing you, indeed giving you political cover for more transformational change. So while I appreciate how much you've tried to collaborate, I still feel like there's a missed opportunity. And that's my sort of general thesis about the bulk of the recommendations in whole. I'll stop there and, and turn it back over to my co-chair and then other committee members to give their reactions. Um, as well. Um, you know, I, I don't um, want to spend too much time. I, I think I will just echo some of the comments around just feeling like it was a bit of a missed opportunity. I think it, just for further con context, right? And I, um, I guess I should have started by saying the, the obvious. I do think that um, RTD has participated 
um, throughout this process. And, uh, you know, GM Johnson being new to this, uh, to this role and the state had an incredible task um, of, uh, you know, jumping into this process. Um, so I commend you for, um, you know, joining and participating. Um, I think um, just from a context standpoint, you know, this was certainly an advisory conversation, advisory, you know, committees commission for, um, by our, our transportation co-chairs, by the governor. Um, and then we, you know, we had this long process and then now, now we are done, right? So then like everything after this, we kind of have no way of supporting, collaborating in some ways. Um, in the way that we might have, I guess, you know, being commissioned in this way. So it's now out of our hands and like, you know, going to, I guess I not clear on where this goes after the fact, right? So um, just now it being with an entirely different body who's gonna be the decision-making body here. Um, but I'll stop there just cause I think, um, I think there might be some other comments from the committee as well. Um, um, I think we can kind of just go, does anyone, does anyone want to share their comments um, who was on the committee? <laughs> right. <laughs> There's a shot. Um, yeah, I do want to comment because I, I think in particular, one of our recommendations has been uh, misunderstood. Uh, I do appreciate RTD's response and consideration of the many recommendations, but uh, I, I have particular concern uh, with the one regarding uh, asking for a study. The, the recommendation said RTD should perform a complete and comprehensive analysis of the Northwest Rail project to establish a common set of assumptions, including cost, ridership, and timeline, and then engage in a regional discussion uh, about the opportunities and alternatives, both near and near term and short term, uh, for the corridor, and uh, RTD said yes, we agree, but their proposal was to go ahead with this eight million dollar study of the Northwest Rail rush hour only service, and this was an issue that our committee gave a lot of attention to. Uh, this Northwest Rail uh, rush hour only service, and hey, the, Brad, the, yep, can I? encourage you not to go deep on Northwest Rail yet. Just, okay. We'll, hold we'll get to that uh, in the specific issues, but if you have general responses, which this is probably related to, but just want well, to do that. The general response is that we appreciate what RTD has done, but we, we do think this is a really big issue that we spend a lot of time on, and, and we do want to dive deep into whether or not that study accomplishes our recommendation and whether it should be an agree or disagree. Okay, thank you. Faith, do you wanna go ahead? Sure, I just have a quick general response. Um, first, I wanna thank all the committee members in RTD and Dr. Cog for the hours and hours of work that they committed to doing this and in all the recommendations that came forward. And I would just say the General Assembly has taken on the values that the COVID response money should be transformational. That it shouldn't just be about surviving, it should be about actually transforming things and doing things better and creating systems that serve people in a better way. And when we look at the behavioral health committee we set up, the housing committee we set up. And so I very much appreciate the responses and I want to ask RTD to strive farther with their COVID response money to actually create that transformational change that sets up a transit community for half the state's population that works better and increases ridership, um, attracts drivers, treats employees well. And so I feel like the responses were fantastic and I'm asking that we push ourselves to be aspirational because that's what the General Assembly has taken on with the money that we have to allocate around um, COVID response money. And I didn't see that in the response. So that's my general overview.
Representative Gray, did you have some general comments you wanted to make? I'm not sure. There you are. Welcome. You're on mute. You're muted. The new Matt Gray doesn't have a voice. What do we think? You, you think I would have figured this out by now, two years into doing all this. Um, can everybody hear me now? Okay. Um, I would just echo most of what Senator Winter had to say. I appreciate the, you know, this has been a unique process in which we didn't have to write, we've written some big laws. We didn't have to write a law to do this where all the parties involved um, came together uh, to collaborate. So I do think that um, we should keep that spirit moving forward in this discussion and thinking um, how to get to sort of win-win situations and how to get to yes uh, you know, on the various things that are left because everybody's done so much work to in a completely voluntary manner uh, work together. So um, let's keep that up and I look forward to the conversation. Brandon, we haven't had a chance to meet yet. I wanted to see if, if you on behalf of the governor's office had any comments you wanted to make. Yeah, um, thank you all. Can everyone hear me? Good. Yeah, I appreciate um, the opportunity to attend this meeting. I was added uh, relatively late in the process, and so um, I'm getting caught up to speed on some of the responses. But I can say from um, just sort of a 30,000 foot view, we do appreciate the work that RTD is doing to address a lot of the issues that have already been mentioned. Um, I would actually also echo uh, Senator Winter's uh, comments as well. And I would just like to say that I know that from the governor's perspective that he would like to RTD to continue to focus on equity and access, making sure that we are able to expand uh, ridership and connect those communities like Boulder that have um, sort of been left out of the, con not the conversation, but have been um, sort of uh, left out of the connectivity, I guess, in, in terms of transit. And so I know that's a big priority from the governor's perspective. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. And, um, you know, I, we, we certainly appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, and just want to see where we where we go from here. And um, I'm just going to listen to everyone else's comments, get caught up to speed. And if there's anything that anyone can do to provide additional context and background, or they want to brief me at any time, I would be open to that as well. So thank you. Thank you. Just going to do a, one look back to see if there's other committee members, anybody else, or even Dr. Cog, who participated in this process that wanted to make any general response comments. Everybody should take another sip of coffee and amp it up. Well, then I don't know, um, Chairman Johnson, if you wanted to, to weigh in at all before we go start diving into some of the specific recommendations that we wanted to have a longer conversation about. Um, I, I want to, this should be more of a dialogue, so um, we want to make sure you have voice throughout this conversation. So let me just make space for RTD to, to say anything at this point. All right, well, well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and to all those that have spoken. I appreciate uh, your earnest and open dialogue uh, relative to the response. And um, in particular, stating that some of the responses were um, underwhelming. Um, as we talk about code red on climate change and equity disparity and having missed opportunities. I just wanna qualify that and this is being done in earnest dialogue. So quite naturally keeping in mind that um, public transport is a major vehicle pun intended as we look to reduce greenhouse gases and RTD is up for the task. I'd be remiss to state that one thing that's interesting about RTD, as we stated at the outset with us all striving to make RTD the best transit agency in the country, we'd be remiss not to acknowledge that it has a 2,342 square mile service area. So in order to do that without getting too much in the weeds about how we deliver transit services, 
all those aspects have to be taken in consideration relative to how we go about leveraging zero emission technology to achieve that goal, which we all are rallying around. In order to do that, we have to have the infrastructure in place, recognizing that RTD has basically a backlog of $290 million in infrastructure. We first have to get our house in order so we can then pull the vehicles in that we could leverage to achieve that going forward. Um, so that is something that we are looking at in earnest as we go down this path to look at our future and ensure that we are providing a better environment in which to deliver transit service. As we talk about equity, that is something that is very important. And I can say specifically to me, you've heard me say on numerous occasions, I believe it's the great societal equalizer as it unleashes people from their limitations. To that, we'd be remiss not to acknowledge that transit has been deeply rooted in racism for a myriad of decades, years. And so also as we talk about uh, racism that is instituted in transit service delivery in this country, the three important areas in which we have to look at to dispel that racism would be number one, amenities. And when we talk about amenities, we're talking about where customers wait to access services. It's important to note that oftentimes you look throughout this district, uh, we just have a bus stop flag and a pole. There's not shelter. So that's a primary issue in and of itself, especially when you want to look at over the road coach service that we coined here as bus rapid transit in comparison to looking at the 15L traveling down, um, you know, Colfax, that's something in and of itself. The second area of disparity uh, that often is uh, propagated by um, transit uh, just in the midst of being in America would be service. And that's something that we're looking at holistically because why should one community get something that another community doesn't? And oftentimes it's at the backs on the backs of black and brown people. And then more specifically, the last element would be transit policing. And that's something we've taken a laser-like focus on as well. And so I am not just um, sitting here providing just dialogue off the top of my head, I would encourage you to go to the Transit Center. They released a video just on Thursday, um, October, God, I think it was October 7th, whereby it talks about these different elements and what might we do collectively um, as responsible stewards to mitigate that going forward. So a lot of this is rooted in our responses since the fair study and equity analysis. We can make assumptions about what it is that we think it may be, but it's important to look at census data, go to where the people are, leverage those communities that oftentimes have been disparaged and have suffered the brunt of a disproportionate burden and a disparate impact. Um, more so as we talk about what we can do to strive together. And I know we had conversations about COVID relief funding that's really been qualified as rescue funding. The intent of those monies basically were to keep operations in such a way whereby we can ensure we had personnel. All of us know that the whole world is understaffed right now. Uh, we are working in earnest, trying to figure out what best we can do. Our wages happen to be low. I'm working to mitigate that. Um, and so there's a myriad of different aspects that go hand in hand, because when we just talk about operators, operators are very important to our, our lifeline of our business, but more so there's other um, aspects of that when we look at having dispatchers and other type of critical positions that they're ready to supplement that going forward. So I too believe that we can have conversations about how we move forward, but recognizing that there are some caveats um, that we have to recognize and speak to in order to get past what it is that we can't do. So as we talk about COVID relief funding, there's other manners, uh, other methods, I should say, that we can leverage. Um, I'd be remiss to say that we don't have state dollars in which some of my counterparts that are running transit agencies across the country can leverage to offer you know, complimentary transit rides, but there's also some other federal funding that we can leverage, congestion mitigation air quality funds. That's how the free ride is free along the 16th Street Mall. We've leveraged those monies for different things and as indicated in the response, we wanna be creative to see what we can do. And that's why we put forward leveraging, you know, a spare the air day because that would be twofold. Basically helping um, equity communities, helping individuals that may not be as familiar with utilizing transport, but while, in tandem supporting a, a cleaner and greener environment. So with that, I will um, yield the floor and I don't know if there's any member of the board that would like to add anything additionally, but um, just wanted to close with those comments. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. I feel like we're getting into the dialogue we want today. So thanks so much for those comments. Sure. Were there board members that wanted to say anything? I'm not seeing any. 
hands. Oh, Lynn, maybe your hand is halfway up. I was looking for my hand. Um, I think Angie was up first if, uh, if she wants to go and then I, I've got a couple of comments. Okay, no. sorry I missed you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to completely concur with our general manager. Um, RTD, the board of directors has been working diligently all year long in tandem with the accountability committee. I wanna thank Lynn and Troy for being our representatives. I think they've done an outstanding job as well as our general manager. And as you can see, our commitment is to community and to make sure that we are looking at providing a stellar service to the entire district. And we've been doing it by making some really serious systemic changes through our strategic plan and also our um, transit equity analysis. So um, I wanna thank all of you for, for meeting so diligently, all 80 meetings I attended, as many of them as I could. Um, and I think it's been a really good, robust discussion. The board has been paying attention. Many board members have participated. And in fact, today we have five board members uh, listening in. So I just wanted to say thank you. And, and I'll uh, add to that my thanks for all everyone who's been so involved. I, know, as I didn't realize, as Elise said, it's been 80 meetings, but I know it's been a lot of work. And thanks to... Um, uh, Senator Winter and Representative Gray and, and the governor's office for all helping make this happen. You know, I think from the board perspective, um, there are many of us, I think generally we're, we're looking for what you're looking for, which is the aspirational, the transformational, and, um, you know, certainly concerned about climate change and, and uh, um, the ozone issues and the air quality. At the same time, we, we run up against some serious issues that Deborah has has laid out this backlog of maintenance and uh, you know uh, other other issues that the limits on COVID relief funding. I think that um, uh, Dan Blankenship had pointed this out before that it, it, there's a lot of things that maybe are being referred to as things we could do with COVID relief funding we can't, but that ultimately perhaps we'd be able to open up some other funds to do some of those things. And I think that's an important um, concept to keep in mind. And uh, it, again, it runs into uh, the realities of, of uh, you know, how do we get, uh, as, as Deborah was saying, wages that will get our operators um, where we want. This, there's some problems that are just, I think, really frustrating to all of us. You know, I, to me, the equity issues are very important, but we can't ignore our commuters. We need to get them back because of those um, those climate and air issues. Um, but it's again, it's how do we get the drivers? Where do we put the drivers? And and how do we balance all of these issues? So um, I'll just say that as you get into some of the the specifics, um, I think um, the will is there, and the uh, um, the balance uh, is often very tough. Well, thanks for those comments. And it seems like a great segue into, we wanted to dive deep in a handful of issues. And let's start with the, the use of, let's broaden it because I think we, I don't wanna get caught up in federal COVID relief versus other funds. It's, we, there is an opportunity with outside resources coming into RTD to do some things innovative differently. Um, and in particular around fares, our recommendations focused a lot on rebuilding ridership. We viewed this as a pivotal point in time for the uh, future of transit and whether or not when we recover from this pandemic and people return to in-person in work at a higher level, whether or not their new normal is riding transit or riding their SOV. Um, and we don't get a chance to do that right twice. And it, we felt pretty strong as a committee, we need to invest resources, marketing, that, that RTD is open for business. We are your ride to wherever you need to go. And we're gonna offer lower fares to jumpstart that ridership. Um, and I appreciate you added some, some language to your response that indicated a willingness to explore that. Um, I think, you know, the cliche that is that RTD has been an agency of no, 
I feel like your response to us makes you an agency of maybe, and we want an agency of hell yes. And uh, I feel like maybe you're on the cusp and maybe we can push you over the edge. But I really think that if RTD waved his hands and says, we want to partner with anybody that has resources to help clean up the air, address climate, address equity, and rebuild ridership, we are ready to go. We're bringing some resources to the table. And it doesn't matter if those are federal funds or the, the sales tax that the federal funds uh, freed up. This is a time and we're all interested in working with you because not only does that rebuild ridership and reestablish transit as a solution, it rebuilds the trust that RT needs to have with the communities it serves which will then in turn open up other doors of revenues and opportunity, which I think is pivotal to this point in time. So um, <clears throat> committee members, did you have specific comments or questions related to the use of um, outside funds and, and fares? Because I know Daya wanted to, to ask some questions around fares. Let's, let's go into that now. Lynn, you're unmuted. Did you want to say anything? No, sorry. No, nope, okay. So Daya, do you want to um, ask some of your questions around fares? Sure. And I'm going to apologize in advance because I am at the conference and had to find a very quiet corner. <laughs> um, so I apologize. Um, I, I think just to echo Elisa's comment or question that, you know, it definitely feels like a maybe. And so, and I, I fully understand that RTD is currently working on its own fair study. I guess it, it's not really clear to me the timeline of the fair study and how that might affect at least the recommendations or get us to um, get us to maybe a yes with some additional considerations when it comes to some of the recommendations that we had made related to the fair structures themselves. So I, I think it might just be helpful to get a sense of where what the timing is right now on the fair study. And then if elements of the RT Accountability Committee's recommendations are being at least considered or uh, incorporated into the fair study itself. Madam Chair, if I may. Now I can't find the mute button. Yes, please. Yes, so th thank you so much, um, Dia, for that question. So to qualify where we are, uh, there's an active solicitation uh, that's on the street right now in which we are requesting proposals. Those are due uh, in just a few days. So those will be assessed so we can find the opt optimal consultant who could shepherd this effort along with us because it's going to be a robust one. With that as the backdrop, we envision putting forth a recommendation for the board's consideration as to who that consultant would be going forward. We anticipate having this robust engagement aspect relative to um, going to where the people are that actually are utilizing the system uh, with various equity populations, and we anticipate that to commence at the beginning of the year. On a parallel track with that, recognizing that we would have a consultant, we want to look at the optimal fare structures, recognizing some of the uh, some of the restrictions and uh, confinements that we have within RTD in and of itself. Um, we anticipate taking that information, basically getting recommendations, and can see an optimal fare structure for the board's adoption uh, the latter part of the year. And so keeping in mind that there have been recommendations put forward by the accountability committee, it is our intent to have that factored into the equation as we engage with these varied populations and then discern what might actually work here within this environment. So as we talk about, you know, fares, be they free fares or be they not, in relationship to what's happening, and I know, um, Chair Jones just specified that there could be people that want to partner and basically are saying, here's some monies and we could do that. But one thing that we have to be cognizant of, and I hate to sound like I'm being a stick in the mud, but I have to say this, we are a recipient of federal dollars. So regardless if we have a private entity giving us money, we have to look at the overarching network in and of itself to ensure that we're not creating any discriminatory practices. So one thing in and of itself that we could have an opportunity to offer free fares to everyone, not just a segment of the extensive service area. So with that, as we talk about monies, while that could be an opportunity to do so, 
This is where a partnership is ideal as we manage expectations in the sense that if we did it for a limited duration of time, i.e. a couple of days and then it goes away, does that yield a great return on investment to expose people? So with that, we are willing to look at all of this. And while it's the, the agency of maybe, it's maybe because we have to have earnest dialogue with all of you all. So we have an understanding of how we go about doing this in such a way where it doesn't appear that we're being disingenuous to the vast majority of the community relative to what it is that we're providing. Does that answer the question, Dea, that you posed? Okay. I, I see Faith's hand up, but I want to interject first. We care deeply about equity and we are right there. But I will say that doing your equity analysis is going to take all of next year, which may be too late in terms of COVID response and getting people back on the bus. It does not negate doing a pilot project. And I say free fares for everybody. That doesn't require an equity analysis. That's equitable. Um, not only is it fair to everybody, it will disproportionately help disproportionately impacted people. So there's still an opportunity to not use that as an excuse to wait, but to be innovative in collecting some data. And again, I don't mean to harp on air quality, but it is an opportunity. If we were to make fares free during ozone season, mm -hmm. you could pri provide a proof of concept to the metro area and say, hey, this is your one good response to ozone. Look how we are taking cars off the road during bad air quality. You like this? Let's all put some money in the coffer and make this permanent. You could be out there asking those questions, pushing that. Just okay. So with no, that, let, it, me, let me. Well, I, if let me, I can, and you know, we're having open and earnest dialogue, yeah. so I support that. And in relationship to the response that we provided, recognizing spare the air days are the one exemption that we have from Title VI as relates to us ensuring that we are basically doing what public transit is intended to do. So I wanna be clear that I am not making excuses because I believe excuses are the tools of the incompetent which are built upon monuments of nothingness and those who use them seldom out to anything else. And that is not me. So I wanna qualify what my intent here in this engaging dialogue to say yes, we can do these elements, but recognizing there is a big price tag that comes with it and what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Because if in fact we do have a plethora of service that we need to deliver, we have to ensure that we're gonna be there when we're gonna say we're gonna be there and recognizing the whole world is short staff, we may, we may not be able to make good on that promise. So yes, there could be some trepidation, but it's in the sense of not putting ourselves out there and not being able to deliver, recognizing that we have a reputation of agency of no, I wanna ensure that we have a reputation of yes, we'll be there at that stop when we say we're gonna be there. So thank you for that. Senator Winner. Um, so it's gonna echo a lot of what Elise said, but I feel like we just had agreement, maybe, around spare the air days as something we could try and do proof of concept, mm -hmm. right? And so if we have both sides in agreement on that, can we start making a plan on how to move forward? And then, you know, I've worked a lot with a lot of agencies on federal funding, but also state funding. And we passed 260, which is going to be a historic investment. You represent half of the state's population, you're going to stand to gain a lot of money from 260. And if we have to qualify that in a way that doesn't jeopardize your federal funding, but opens up other ways to spend your funding, I've done that in other situations. I'm more than happy to do that. So if we have to qualify the state funding that we've increased for you can go to fair reducement or serving uh, low-income populations, we can do that and we're here to do that and we should have that policy conversation offline. Um, so one, do we have agreement that we can actually start moving forward on a plan for spare the air days? And two, can we talk about how we qualify state funding to meet these goals? So thank you very much, uh, Senator Winner. And I would say yes and yes. As it, as it relates to spare the air day, I have spare the air days. I have already had conversation with 
you know, my team. And we're willing and able to go forward with that because we have to stand up a program in and of itself quite naturally. We'd have to work with Dr. Cog. We want to work with the TMOs and the TMAs and work with a myriad of different partners. So when it is stated by a meteor meteorologist that there is, you know, the air quality is at a certain level, that automatically that triggers that, hey, you hop on uh, a revenue vehicle that will not be charging you revenue. So yes, there are opportunities going forward. There's models, um, you know, that we could basically uh, emulate uh, in different parts of the country that have been doing this for decades. And you just so happen to have a person at the helm that is very familiar with leveraging spare the, spare the air days and working in partnership with the MPO to make it come to fruition. So we're there for it. And then more specifically to the question you asked about you know, legislation where it specifically speaks to that, I would say that as well, because that has been my experience where there's no confusion about what these dollars are allocated for. So there's skin in the game relative to understanding what it is that we're trying to do for the betterment in the region in which we're providing service. And I, and I welcome the opportunity and we can have a conversation offline with, sorry, I hit mute by accident, thank you. Thank you for that. I feel like we just made some really, really important progress. Uh, so thank you, Senator Winner, for putting that, um, putting a fine point on that and, and asking the question. And so we have some actionable things coming out of this meeting, which is wonderful. I wanna see if my co-chair or any committee members have anything more they wanna add on this topic before we move on to the next one. Or, or RTD, anybody, sorry, didn't mean to limit. So, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, Elise, um, you're, you're asking feedback on this particular item or this ca a category of recommendations at this point? The uh, use of federal funding um, and, and questions around fares. Just to clarify, I don't have anything in, in addition to add. So there were two other topics. Oh, Dan. Morning, everyone. Um, as I think about the conversation, um, I know there's an eagerness to uh, get RTD to uh, be nimble and, and act on a lot of the committee's recommendations. And I think the recommendations overall are, are really good and valid, but I recognize that they're a large organization and, and it's tough for them to turn on a dime. Um, they uh, have to be concerned really, the bottom line is safety, I think. And then they're highly regulated. And these are very uncertain times when it comes to managing any organization, but particularly a large organization and they're constrained by collective bargaining agreements. and. Um, Right now, what we're seeing at RAFTA, which is an organization that is much, much smaller than RTD, is that we're having a difficult time uh, recruiting employees and retaining employees. And we've had to raise our wages substantially. Um, our, the goods and services that we need to run our operation are all being heavily impacted by inflation and construction costs on bids that we put out there where we've been uh, successful in getting somebody to bid on the projects have been uh, 30 to 40% higher than normal uh, because contractors are uh, also uh, having a hard time attracting labor and uh, there are supply chain issues and the uh, cost of copper, for example, uh, has doubled in the last few months. So, um, while I recognize there's this desire to get RTD to move, uh, they need to be a bit cautious about the decisions they make because of the unintended consequences and the unforeseen consequences of making a, a snap decision uh, in order to try to uh, you know, uh, implement these recommendations from the accountability committee uh, and make everybody feel good about it. Uh, but I, I sense in the comments that uh, General Manager Johnson has made that there's a willingness on the part of RTD to 
make the organization better. And uh, here's what the committee has said. But I, I do think because of the COVID environment that we're operating in right now, that's disrupted everything, that uh, there does need to be uh, some cool heads at the helm to make decisions that are going to ultimately result uh, in the best outcome for all of the citizens in the community, all of the employees at RTD. And, uh, and I feel like that's what they're trying to do. Thanks for that nice dose of reality. That's why you and Chairman Johnson run transit agencies and I do not. Any other comments? So the two other topics that we know we want to talk about are local service councils and Northwest Rail, and then we'll see how much time we have left and, and any others. Um, if we could take on the local service councils and the Northwest Rail um, in that order, um, and I, I'm happy to kick off on local service councils and, um, and then turn it over to Julie Mullica, who is the subcommittee chair who, who dealt with that. Um, one of the huge issues that we heard loud and clear from the communities that RTD serves is a feeling that they weren't as much a part of decision making, um, particularly about how transit played out in their um, community as, of what, as well as how it connected to their other communities nearby. Um, but wanting a real meaningful seat at the table. And um, RTD has responded with these listening sessions, which are laudable. Um, I, I wanna push a little bit harder on that. People don't just want to be listened to. They actually want to be a part of the decision-making and feel that what they've said actually results in action on the ground. So they're looking for more partnership and the local service councils that we envisioned through our recommendations were really that. And you have agreed to put together a working group to talk about roles of, of local service councils. We were hoping for a, yes, we'll do local service councils, they'll be meaningful, and we'll hold a working group to decide on the geography, which was our recommendation. So I just wanna underscore how important this recommendation is and really actually implementing it in a meaningful way to rebuilding trust with communities, which then again, I think is one of the most important things that RTD could do right now, because then that opens, opens doors for, again, additional partnership and revenues. So Julie, did you want to add anything to that um, as the overseer of that subcommittee? I did. Yes. Thank you so much for kicking that off. I think the only thing that I really want to add is just emphasize what Elise was saying is that, you know, folks, folks love to be listened to. That's great. But what we were really looking at with the service councils is how do we get folks a seat at the table? And that is what we were really kind of driving home with the service councils. And I completely understand that there's, there's some details, right, that, that the committee was not able to hash out, especially when it comes around um, the tracks. Uh, the, if it, is it going to be, um, you know, county-based or if it's going to be, um, uh, you know, a, a different kind of track of how those service councils are going to be organized. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into there, but the, the listening sessions are great we need to seat at the table. And I think that we, as in not only elected officials, but community members, transit users, um, people who are day-to-day -day in the trenches of using and working with um, RTD. So I think that is just the piece that is kind of missing a little bit is, you know, where is that, that stronger governance model um, that, you know, we're really getting people at the table, people sharing ideas um, and being part of that process in a more um, solidified manner. Anybody else want to chime in before Chairman Johnson has a chance to respond? Yeah, Lise, um, I, I, I'm going to jump in here. Um, I mean, so I agree with um, all that's been said, I think um, kind of circling back on my earlier comment about a missed opportunity, um, you know, a specific example, at least regarding what I meant is, you know, the recommendation could have looked like, um, 
like an attempt, you know, and, and maybe this is, there are reasons why it doesn't look this way, but it just, you know, if you read the recommendation and the response, it's agree. And then like a statement about why it's important and why you would agree. And it could have gone a little bit further, right? The recommendation uh, or response to the recommendation could have been, you know, a, a timeline, right? Like, you know, if let's say you can't commit to that at this point, although I think we <laughs> would have hoped that that would have been like an easy, you know, like, what is it, the low hanging fruit, um, um, you know, it could have looked like, yes, this is a great idea. I'm, I can't commit to certain parts, these are the things that we have to, you know, overcome. I think that that's like generally the tone, like kind of navigating some uncertainties with how we can spend certain dollars, like that granularity around. Um, and and I say timeline specifically, just because that is like a specific request that ha that was made prior conversations. Hey, can we get a timeline? Like, it, I guess it's just it feels like a different level of like commitment to the, a particular idea is if there's like tangible numbers or timelines around what that, you know, implementation could look like. I know that was specific asks um, for this recommendation and, and others um, as well. So just to, I just want to be again, like full circle on what I mentioned earlier of what that could have looked like. And in, in my opinion, um, before, um, and if anyone else has any comments, but I wanted to like contextualize that. Um, before um, GM Johnson uh, spoke, uh, I um I wasn't in all the meetings where you talked about this, but just as an experience um, serving on city council when routes were cut, specifically airport routes, where we had a lot of airport workers that relied on that route, um, having a council like this sharing what that meant. Um, I think would have been really important because by the time we got to the public comment meeting, it was too late. And um, it just, it, the, the workers' voices had been taken into context and that was a decade ago, right? And we're changing and we're growing and we're doing new things, but had something like this been in place, I think we would have done something different before we even got there, um, which is why I think having the on the ground voices and involvement in the decision making and not just listening um, is impactful. Thanks, Senator Winter. I, uh, Brandon, I saw you turn on your camera. Did you have a comment to make before we turn it over to? Actually, yeah, I, I just wanted to let everyone know I actually do have to leave um, early. Unfortunately, there's a scheduling conflict, but I will follow up um, with members of the committee just to uh, get filled in on what I might may have missed. Um, this has been very productive, uh, uh, productive, and I appreciate um, Senator Winter and her um, and her ask for uh, if we need to do more with qualifying state funding to address some of these needs. And so this is something I think that we, sh we should actually take a strong look at. And um, there are uh, there have been a lot of good comments that I think have been very productive and helpful. And uh, I will follow up with members um, um, this week. I just wanna say thank you for allowing me to be here and for allowing me to speak. And um, I, I will see you all in the next meeting. Thanks so much. We really appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good day. CEO Johnson, do you want to respond to the comments? Yeah, so thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I want to say those are very helpful um, in reference to outlining what the expectations were because we approached it from the vantage point that we supported this going forward. And in relationship to uh, Council Member Mullica's statement about a timeline and things of the like, we were approaching it from the vantage point, yes, let's convene a working group so we can discern how best we go about it, as opposed to RTD stepping in saying this is a fait accompli and this is what we envision. Because recognizing the myriad of different audiences that'll be involved, i.e. an elected official versus an actual uh, transit customer versus a community stakeholder, there could be different elements that are involved holistically. So we wanna ensure that we understand those pain points and basically be able to leverage a service council that will address the needs recognizing that service planning is a certain, uh, takes a certain skill, it's different from long range planning. Um, we, want, we want it to 
make sure that we convene people and had set dialogue about how we should bring it to fruition. So I just wanted to qualify that because at the advent of this discussion, I believe you all heard me say myriads of time that we supported the service council notion, but recognizing that there was just a misunderstanding about what your expectations are, this can easily be remedied. Uh, we already have an internal group of staff that have been supporting this effort working to talk about our path forward. And so we're outlining that, recognizing as we try to juggle delivering service, trying to ensure that we have ad adequate people um, and retaining those, it's just basically a balancing act in reference to what it is from a prioritization standpoint. But make no mistake about it, we support the service council aspect going forward. And I really believe from my perspective that we should bring voices to the table to help determine what that is. So um, I don't know if any uh, board member would like to opine on this at this juncture, but wanted to ensure that I wasn't dominating the conversation from the RTD standpoint. Uh, let's see. Uh, Madam Chair, I would just concur with that. I think that we're really trying to do our due diligence and not um, make any assumptions. We, we wanna make sure we have everything in Step. So I think this is a really great conversation to have so that um, we both know where we're coming from and how we can move together. So I think this is exciting in terms of coming up with a plan of action on the local councils and that we do want, we are listening. We do want to move forward with that. It looks like um, Lynn has a comment as well. Yeah, I, I think this is also really helpful because uh, what it comes down to, the crux of it is um, figuring out what is listening, what staff needs to do, what can be done, you know, how to really make people feel like they have a seat at the table and are part of that decision making process. So I think that, uh, um, that drawing that line is helpful as uh, RTB moves forward on this. And it looks like board member Chantel Lewis's hand is up as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. I just wanted to, to chime in and, and say I, I appreciate the dialogue and the discussion. And I also recognize that, or you all should recognize that we have the, the CAC and we have two disability committees. And so like when we talk about folks having a seat at the table, I think it's a good opportunity for us to pause and um, see what questions uh, that we are looking to be solved, what answers that we're hoping for, because I think there's opportunity to restructure some of the things that we have currently in RTD and not to add another layer of um, bureaucracy um, as we are moving forward. Uh, thank you. <laughs> as we are moving forward um, with th these local councils and, and also to underscore that sometimes when we are moving forward to make these committees more equitable, sometimes we create inequities. And so when we talk about access, when we talk about opportunity, when we talk about access to capital, to uh, political capital, whatever that might be, um, we have to be cognizant of that. And so I think what I'm hearing is it's not, it's not a no, but we have to be intentional about how we plan these things and how we incorporate what's already within RTD so that we're using our resources efficiently and effectively. Thanks for all those comments. I just had one quick question um, for Chairman Johnson, and just in terms of the timing on when you anticipate, I, I, since the committee won't exist after this meeting um, in about a half hour, um, uh, when state lawmakers, the governor's office should expect to hear more about what the next steps are with the service councils, just to tie a bow on the timeline issue. So thank you so much for that question. And I would say that I would probably be in a position to have a more concrete timeline as we look at January. Right now we're in the midst of budget development and things of the like and questions have been posed. Do we need somebody to help stand this up? You know, And so I would be getting in front of myself if I provided that timeline since we have yet to taken a proposed budget to the board, but I would be in a better situation to say in January, we could provide finite outline of what we anticipate that to be going forward since we're really looking at 2022 to be the jump off point on a myriad of different issues that have spawned out of here in relationship to the strategic plan I've referenced as well. Great, thanks for that. You're and welcome. We will look forward to the new year on that. So if there aren't more comments on this one, I promised Rut that he would get a few minutes to talk about the Northwest Rail analysis that he did 
and his, his reaction to your response. And actually, before you transition, I just wanted to one more comment here. I just want to make sure um, since we're, it sounds like there was some, you know, there were some comments made about like, maybe there was a, some misunderstanding around what expectations were. So I just wanted to like name or call out any other, if anyone else has any other expectations or requests of RTD so that we're setting them up for success. Like it would be <laughs> a missed opportunity if we talked about <laughs> not having be clear on what those expectations are. And then there's still any outstanding um, requests as it comes, as it relates to that particular um, a recommendation. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was said. Um, and if anything after today kind of bubbles up, communicating that with RTD before um, it sounds like as soon as possible, right? Um, so just before we transition. Good point. Um, yes, and I'm, I'm just gonna pause for a second because I have to jump off in one minute. I pushed my last call to be 10 minutes late. So I have one minute left. Um, and I just want to say on Northwest Rail, I think we are at the place in time where we have an opportunity to leverage what RTD has done to preserve funding for Northwest Rail. Um, the What local communities have done for Northwest Rail and where Amtrak and the federal government is on funding that a once in a lifetime opportunity to make it happen. And it is about equity and serving our communities. It's what our communities voted on. And ultimately um, we, it will serve a lot of workers and a lot of people that don't have other transit options. Um, and the only way we're gonna get this done is if RTD, the state and local governments and our come together. Uh, to make it happen. And I hope that we can build that coalition. Um, and so I have to jump off. I'm, I apologize, but Representative Gray and I have talked a lot about this in the upcoming topics and I fully know he can represent me and I will talk to you all soon. And I thank you all for your work. Thank you, Senator Winner. Really appreciate all your involvement. All right, Rhett. The floor is hey, yours. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump in here by, by first saying I'm sorry that we can't talk about the other three un, unfinished corridors, but uh, we have a limited amount of time and bandwidth to get through all this. But, but the, the specific issue is recommendation 16 clearly states that RTD should perform a complete and comprehensive analysis of the Northwest Rail Project to establish the common set of assumptions about cost, ridership, timeline, and all these other things, and then uh, engage in a regional discussion with all the impacted communities in the Northwest Corridor. Alternatives, short, near term. But, but RTD said, we agree, but then they said their plan is to invest $8 million in a study of Northwest Rail rush hour only service. Unfortunately, that peak service study does very little to inform RTD and the other Northwest Corridor stakeholders of the real potential and opportunities and, and challenges of the Northwest Rail Project, as promised in the original Fast Tracks proposal. So what are these, why, is, why isn't it true that that solves this problem and, and addresses uh, what the people in that community need in order to really understand the challenges and the opportunities. The peak service project is based on three round trips per weekday on a single track rail service and existing single tracks that are used by, by Burlington Northern Santa Fe as freight tracks. There's no new uh, major track or, or really no new construction project in, in that study. And by comparison, the Northwest Rail Project is gonna require dual tracks throughout that entire line. And, uh, and it's a seven day per week service instead of weekdays, three, three trains uh, on an RTD estimated 55 trains per day. Now, uh, that is not only gonna have environmental and, and construction related 
disruptions that are not addressed by doing a study on the rush hour service. Uh, but the most critical issue is that right away. I mean, how is Burlington Northern Santa Fe going to feel about their existing freight business, which is their top priority, uh, if you suddenly throw a huge number of additional vehicles out, additional so I think I think that doesn't fit very well in terms of, of, of that. But furthermore, we took a hard look at the proposed rush hour only service. And the analysis is in our final report in Appendix 5, and it's based entirely on RPD's own data that they presented at the uh, board's Northwest Rail Study Section. In brief, RTD estimates the capital cost of the project at $708 million. And RTD projects riderships for 800 people uh, with each annual, annually traveling round trip on 250 days, the non-holiday weekdays. If you look at a 2% interest over 30 years, on that amount of money, um, it would it would basically amount to thirty seven point seven three million dollars a year. RTD has also estimated the annual operating cost at thirteen and a half million. So that totals over fifty million dollars a year to support eight hundred workers, with what amounts to a two hundred and fifty six dollar round trip train ride on two hundred and fifty days. If you look at that over a year, that works out to $64,000 to provide transit for each one of those workers. It just doesn't make any economic sense. If you ask those workers, well, do you want us to give you a ride back and forth to work or a check for $64,000 every year? I'm pretty sure I know what they'd say to that. But even if you double the ride ship, the rush hour service just doesn't make economic sense. And, and it also doesn't inform the bigger question of Northwest Rail. So we're still, that $8 million for the survey is gonna come out of the taxpayer supported Fast Track's internal savings account, the FISA account. And so instead of spending money for a project that is really not going to be economically viable, RTD really ought to consider the original recommendation 16 and do a complete and comprehensive analysis of the Northwest Rail project. Of course, we are a committee who can only recommend, but we, we do hope that RTD will reconsider this. If not, RTD's response should clearly be changed to disagree, not agree. If you're not gonna do the Northwest Rail study, then we're not really following executing the recommendation that this committee made. I, I have time and again asked for feedback. Does any, did, can anybody show me errors in how this analysis has been done? Are the numbers wrong or anything else? I've never gotten anything that says, no, your numbers are off. And if they're not off, $256 a round trip, it, it's just not, I think, something you'd want to admit to anybody. And, and given the budget that RTD is facing and the cash flow problems that they're facing, uh, adding $50 million a year to your bottom line expenses is not a good idea. Okay. I have said my Thank piece. I'd look forward to comments. <laughs> Rudd obviously has done a deep dive on this. Um, I see uh, Representative Gray's hands up. So maybe we'll go to him and see if there's any other comments before we turn it over to RTD for their response. Yeah, I would just say, and Senator Winter, before she left, alluded to this. I think that spending a lot of money on an RTD funded only study right now um, is probably premature because we allocated $2 million to the Front Range Rail Commission in Senate Bill 260 um, to get to study and look at approvals for Front Range Rail. And there, the Front Range Rail Commission, which we just reconstituted in a different bill that I ran, um, identified the exact same route as Northwest Rail as their preferred uh, option for Amtrak service if we get Amtrak service. And Amtrak 
has got three different things on the map, um, but our local folks have been pushing them towards the front range rail path. Now there's no, there no chance in the world that we're gonna have RTD trains and Amtrak trains and BNSF trains all running next to each other. We're not, that, that, that's a pipe dream. So, and it, it's also a waste of resources. And so what I would say is before I would start spending money on an independent study, I would, I would ask for interface with the Front Range Rail Commission who the state just gave $2 million to, um, to study very similar things. And also to see if Congress actually comes through with an actual infrastructure bill because they keep promising to do it. I learned not to sit and hold my breath and wait for promises from the United States Congress, but I wouldn't recommend that RTD start spending a bunch of independent money on the, There's a lot of things RTD can do with $8 million. And I'm not saying never do it, um, but I'm saying I would hold off on that where we you know gave a smaller amount of that money but it was mostly in hopes of bringing in federal dollars and it's not impossible that we will and we should know within the next few at least the next few months whether the money's going to be there because there's billions for amtrak in there and amtrak i don't know if everybody has seen it i can send it out to the group you know doing front range rail like they want to go pueblo to cheyenne you know um is on their roadmap if they get enough money out of the federal government. Um, and if so, there's already like, you know, that's where most of the money is gonna come from. You know, we know the funding challenges that are, are there for RTE to independently do Northwest Rail, like we know that. But, so that's what I would say is I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend millions right now. I mean, a year from now, it could be a different conversation about well, look, the federal government never got it done. You know, they got gridlocked. They're, they're very good at that. Um, but for now, with this, you know, the, the, the infrastructure bill that would send a bunch of money to Amtrak, um, you know, already passed the Senate. It's just a question of politics in the House right now. And I would wait to see how that shakes out. And then we can have conversations because Senator Winter and I have met with, um, the the federal lobbyists for Amtrak, um, you know, about this. And, you know, they take it really seriously. Again, you can't always count on it, but I would say hold off on it for now um, because if you've got that money, and I know there's money in the savings account, like I think it is going to be a state, local, federal partnership um, if we ever get this done. But I think most of the money is probably going to have to come from the federal government, frankly, to be able to afford it. So I would say this is probably a better time to keep our powder dry and see how, see whether or not, you know, the 800 pound gorilla is going to come in and help provide a lot of the money to actually build the infrastructure versus, um, you know, sort of spending more money researching whether or not RTD can afford something that we don't, we're almost certainly can't afford. And so th th those are just my thoughts and then happy to hear what the district has to say. Thanks Representative Gray. Um, let me turn it over to RTD Chairman Johnson. If you wanna respond, I see you have a board member with their hand up as well. So I'll let you orchestrate the choreograph the response. Okay, so thank you so much. And thank you for the dialogue about Northwest Rail. Um, just at a very high level, recognizing the comments that, um, you know, uh, Rut put forward, what we are trying to do collectively is ensure we have a common set of facts. Because regardless what we may do with BNSF, we don't know what that looks like because we don't have current numbers. And I will say first and foremost, as I came into this organization, I was one of the advocates to say, okay, we're talking in abstracts, let's figure out what it is that we need to do going forward. Because as we talk about front range rail, as we talk about you know, working with CDOT and a myriad of other entities, I wanna be clear that we basically, IERTD has entered into an MOU saying that we will work in tandem with those entities that have been you know, called out by Representative Gray and by you, Rhett, as well. And so as we march down this path, we wanna ensure that we are collaborating holistically 
But I would be remiss to state when we were having a conversation with the board, recognizing they represent a district in some, that there was earnest dialogue about uh, funds that were being put forward. So basically it's here as a common set of facts, what we're doing and quite naturally, we have engaged with a myriad of different um, stakeholders along said corridor as well. So I just wanted to qualify that, but I will yield the floor uh, to the board members because the meeting uh, in which this was discussed, there was earnest dialogue, um, People disagreed, but they weren't disagreeable in doing so. And it was robust discussion about our path forward. So with that, um, I see Director Lewis's hand is up. Director Lewis, please chime in. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I really appreciate this discussion and this dialogue. And, and just as a gentle reminder that as the directors, when we talk about equity, um, I think this is one of the topics that we um, bring about pretty often um, because we're supposed to look at the region, right, as it pertains to equity. And, and with the Fast Tracks program, the Northwest Rail isn't the only project within that program that remains incomplete. And so when we talk about transit equity and an investment of our dollars, I think this is a real great opportunity for us to really test what is it that we're talking about and how we're defining equity, um, I think is important. And so with this specific recommendation, while I understand um, the discussion around, you know, this being uh, something that was proposed in 2014 or 2004, excuse me, and and um, expected by the voters, I think this is a great opportunity for us to have some honest dialogue. Um, and Senator <laughs> uh, Gray, I think it's important that you know that we, as a board, many board members disagreed and agreed that we should move that $8 million forward. But what we all don't talk about when we're talking about the spending of $8 million is our deferred projects list, right? Um, and so these, these decisions come at the cost or the expense rather of those who are utilizing our services and have been utilizing our services throughout the pandemic. And those folks have been wor workers, right? Folks who've had to literally, quite literally choose between their lives and their livelihoods. Um, and, and so I think it's important to bring that about and to bring the faces into this space that we are discussing um, and spending $8 million in, in this point, I thought was probably not a wise idea, but we, um, our democracy and our board uh, moves accordingly as they should. Uh, but that does come at the expense of our, our riders who are dependent on our services. And those riders typically look like me, right? Look like um, other members of this body. Uh, and I think it's important to note that. Uh, and, and, this, and the focus on the Northwest Rail is in its nature, not an equitable conversation because we're not talking about the full fast tracks program. And I would, I would go as far as to say that in my district, the L, um, which is also the extension from the L to the University of Colorado A-line would probably yield more ridership um, than what we're talking about with the Northwest Rail. And so when we talk about it being good stewards of dollars, this is a prime example of us not doing that. Thank you. Um, I see Lynn Geisinger has her hand up as well. Yeah, thanks so much, um, Elise. I think, you know, this is a really interesting conversation and I'm, I'm kind of hearing some different things before um, Senator Winter left. You know, she was talking about this being sort of a once in a lifetime opportunity. And, and I think that keeping in mind what, you know, some of Director Lewis's concerns and what Red has brought up and, and you know where Deborah Johnson has been leading us. Uh, the board has has been trying to respond to that moment, and um, I, I believe, uh, Rhett, in terms of um, you know whether we're looking at the uh, at the um, peak period versus the the whole um, build out that staff if, and Deborah, correct me if I'm wrong, but my my understanding is that staff felt like we have good numbers about the whole um, build out. They are a few years old, but that, that, that those numbers are pretty good. All of this um, went to uh, the stakeholders in the Northwest Corridor and, and uh, um, the, there was a proposal to look at a $12 million study 
um, that would have uh, potentially looked a, a little more broadly. I think that the stakeholders supported this study, but you know, I, I have the same concern. Whatever we're doing should be moving us towards um, this this opportunity if Amtrak money is is coming forward. So I guess um, that would that is where the, the board was was moving. You know, the timing. Um, Matt, in terms of, of the infrastructure bill, it does keep getting dragged out. Um, and there's no guarantees about where that money will come from, but, but the purpose and, and the thought is uh, to, to be ready to share that trek if that's necessary or build the infrastructure in a way that all of those um, trains could be moving through there if that's where we end up. Thanks for putting a bow on a complicated um, issue. And um, I'm noticing we have 60 seconds to wrap up this year's worth of time and investment in working to help make RTD that amazing transit agency we all um, want it to be. Um, so again, our, the committee service ends in 60 seconds but these issues don't go away. And I think we all um, are happy to be engaged at, 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 in a way that would be useful to RTD or to lawmakers or the governor's office to um, not let these recommendations die, but actually see them come to fruition. So I wanna thank um, uh, the committee members for their service, RTD for its partnership and, and Dr. Cog for its assistance in this process. And I'm hoping that this was not a year wasted, but a useful investment in our community. And I'm confident and optimistic that it was. So thanks to everyone and Crystal. Can, can I, yeah, can yep. I borrow an extra 30 seconds? I we didn't get to the driver shortage part of this, but I'll say something that I've said in a bunch of meetings, including before COVID, during COVID and after COVID. Um, it's this looming problem that we talk about all the time and it was a problem when unemployment was low. It was a problem when unemployment was high. And now it's, an it's a problem when unemployment is middle. And it would be great to hear some concrete responses to doing it. Like, you know, Amazon and FedEx and UPS are finding ways to get drivers on the road. And if it's, we can't pay them enough, we need money. If that's what it is, then all right. If they're paying that much more, seeing like a comparative analysis would be great. Um, but it's been like the great white whale of the district since pre-COVID for as long as I've been, you know, in leadership on the transportation committee. So that goes back a good number of years now. So I just wanted, to, I wanted to plug that. I'd love to get a little bit more quantifiable and Director Johnson, you, uh, CEO Johnson, you don't need to answer this right now. I would love to see a more tangible plan about how to address it other than just saying we're a victim of it. Um, because folks in the private sector are figuring a way to get all the Amazon packages on everybody's front porch right now um, to figure out how we how we bridge that gap. So sorry for keeping everybody along. I know, um, I know at least we want you know, we we need to wrap it up. I I just need to give my sixty seconds. It turns out on that. You operate at a higher pay grade than I do. So Oh, we I have a very that. low pay grade, to be perfectly clear. That's true. You don't get paid anything, but um, I think it would only be fair to let Chairman Johnson respond if she wants. If not, that's fine too, but. No, thank you so much. Um, and Representative Gray, you wrote a very important fact. Um, and one thing I'm careful about doing, I run the organization and I own it. Um, so I don't want to point fingers and play Monday morning quarterback about what happened in the past. But one thing for certain, as I've done my due diligence, a lot of that could have been mitigated going forward. And now we're in a precarious position because we were behind the eight ball from the outset, right? So with that as a backdrop, you've brought up private entities. And yes, there's a myriad of things that they can do. We are trying to do some of those things as well. It's going to take a large investment as we go forward because our uh, hourly wages are substantially low. Um, I believe that there was a laser focus on, um, you know, being 
economically uh, thrifty as it relates to what it is. And I think that speaks to the overarching aspect of how we invested in our employees, uh, recognizing that I can't delve too deeply because these are bargainable items as we look at you know uh, labor and how we're represented. Um, but we are working in earnest trying to shore that up. Another critical point of this is oftentimes people want what they want when they want it. And when we have a bus route, for instance, that we're expending exorbitant, exorbitant dollars on per revenue hour and you have three boardings per hour, that may not be a good use of dollars. And so I believe there was um, not a willingness to perhaps say that we have some you know, low performing routes. And in doing that, we did not have enough individuals uh, to meet the needs of what our revenue service hours were allocated for on a budget. So with that as the backdrop, we do have a plan that we're working through. It's going to take a lot uh, because when you can go work for waste management and basically be able to drive around a refuse truck and make $8 more an hour than it is with engaging with individuals on a regular basis that may not have a sunny disposition, um, it'll take a lot to shore that up and it's not gonna be remedied overnight. But my team and I are confident that those that want to be a part of something great in ensuring that they're making lives better through connections and the way we're going about sourcing candidates, we could yield a return on investment. And we have such plans in place right now, but it is contingent upon what we can do to bring these individuals in and have them feel supported. So I'm more than willing to talk with you offline and we can, you know, have a more concrete timeline. So thank you very much for broaching that. Okay. Elise, just wanted to offer my two cents. Thank you, everyone. I know we're wrapping up um, this, you know, I just wanted to offer and I, I think other committee members will similarly, though we don't have the same platform as we did with this RTD accountability committee to um, help push move forward. Um, some of these really great ideas, I, you know, I wanted to extend the offer to continue working with you all. Um, to our uh, legislative partners um, to you. Um, uh, CEO Johnson our, at RTD, our RT board. Um, if I could, you know, we can offer additional context as you start planning out the work here, please, I think, could consider me and, and the team resources in that regard. And Elise, I think we, are we ready to gavel out for the last time? <laughs> I think so. All righty, team, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All Thanks, right. everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.